some troubles too. I've uh, been having some chest pains and different problems at football practice. He's going for blood work and they're trying to figure out exactly what the problems are, but we want to keep those uh, brothers uh, in our prayers. Also, we're grateful to have uh, Dr. Doug Burleson here from Free Hartman University. For anybody who wasn't here last night, he's teaching uh, First and Second Timothy, uh, doing it in a wonderful way. And we appreciate the uh, a man of his intellect being here with us uh, to teach us. Last night's class was great, and I expect even uh, greater things today as we delve further into the text. Uh, and we are very grateful for his presence. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and we'll just turn it over to him. Let's all bow. Heavenly Father, we're thankful unto thee for this beautiful day that you blessed us with. We're thankful for the Christian fellowship that we enjoy for this occasion that brings us together at a time like this to study more of thy word. We're thankful for Brother Burleson, and we pray for a uh, long life for him in service to thee. We're thankful for his great knowledge and for the hours and hours of effort that he has put in uh, to preparation for a study like this. And we pray for all of us as students, Father, that we will uh, take the things that he says and examine them very carefully up against thy word and apply them to our lives when we found them to be right. Heavenly Father, continue to bless uh, our congregation here and especially be with those that are sick and uh, have asked interest in our prayers, especially tonight for Brother Smith, uh, also for Landon. We, Father, we pray that all the tests and things that he's going through will come back successful as well. Heavenly Father, be with us and bless us. Most of all, forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope that you've had a good day. Uh, I've had a great day just being able to think about being with you again tonight. I uh, appreciate so much your interest in the class and pray that uh, what we talked about last night was profitable to you and uh, what we'll talk about tonight. We're going to be looking at three chapters right in the heart of 1 Timothy. I've tried to give each chapter of the ten between these two letters an hour and that doesn't you know, obviously include the break. So uh, my plan tonight is to start in 1 Timothy chapter 2 in our first hour, which is actually the shortest uh, of the chapters by verse, but it is uh, one of the most difficult in terms of its content. And then in our second hour will be in 1 Timothy 3, which is uh, famous for being the chapter where we read the qualifications of elders and deacons, and there's a lot of good discussion there. And then we'll conclude tonight, Lord willing, in our last hour with 1 Timothy 4, which is a chapter that kind of gets overlooked, to be honest with you, because uh, chapters 2 and 3 have so much to say uh, with regard to questions that are controversial in the religious world that chapter 4 can easily be overlooked. I don't want to do that, and so I appreciate the fact that these are being recorded, and I hope that we can speak with clarity tonight with regard to what we're going to say. I want to start by drawing a quick picture that I like to uh, use to illustrate the process that we're trying to uh, engage here. We're going to build a bridge in this study. Uh, when I think about preaching or Bible study, I think about it as bridge building. Um, as a matter of fact, there's an old book written by a guy named John Stott on preaching. The book's titled Between Two Worlds, Preaching as Bridge Building. I view uh, what we're doing, biblical interpretation, as bridge building. And here's what I mean by that. On one side of the bridge, you have Paul's world, 
Now, obviously, we could change that to the world of Jesus or the world of Abraham. Uh, that's the context in which these events took place. And then on this side of the ravine, we have our context. Um, and so part of our task in interpreting the Bible is to be able to move from exegesis, which is an exploration of the text in its original context, uh, historical, literary, theological. That's why we took some time last night to introduce the background uh, of these two letters, moving from that to application. And uh, I may have mentioned this last night, but when I think about preparing a sermon, I'm answering two questions. I'm answering, what does the text say? And then I'm answering, why does that matter? I call it the what and the so what. So what does 1 Timothy 2 say, and why does that matter? Now, the obvious answer is because it's the Word of God, and I appreciate that. But what I mean by the so what is, um, was what Paul says in chapter 2 regarding women in the assembly uh, in Ephesus something that is applied in our world. So here's what happens. If we only spend time on one side of the ravine, we're talking about history, and we're talking about the world of Paul, but we're failing to apply that in our context as Christians who are striving to please God. If we only talk about our context, and here's, maybe let's just imagine you go to two congregations, and at one place... Uh, the preacher gets up and gives an excellent uh, sermon on the tabernacle of Israel. And he talks about the holy place, the most holy place, and the courtyard, and the furniture, and how it was built according to the pattern God showed Moses on the mountain, and it lasts until the time of Solomon. And then he prays, and you go. And there's no question of why the tabernacle of Israel ought to help your faith in 2017 as a child of God. You go to another congregation, and the guy gets up, and he starts reading stuff off the internet and talking about uh, trouble in the Middle East and talking about Trump and health care. He's talking about things that are in the news right now, but he never once cracks open his Bible. You've had two extremes. You've had a history lesson, and you've had a discussion of contemporary events. What you've not had is a healthy study of the Word of God that starts the foundation of God's perfect word and seeks to apply that in our world. So what we're trying to do in our study is to provide a balance where we're looking at these verses, trusting that the words of 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, is profitable uh, for approval, for correction, for instruction, for training in righteousness. But that's our foundation, but we're also still very much aware uh, of the fact that these ancient words are still living, inspired words that are still the Word of God. And so uh, sometimes that's difficult to apply, like head coverings of 1 Corinthians 11 raises a lot of questions about culture and what does that mean today. Well, we're going to get into some of those questions as we go, but foundationally we're trying to make that connection and build that bridge between exegesis and application. So what I'm going to do is I hope that we can just open up our Bibles and <clears throat> for each of these three chapters tonight, I'm going to put an outline of the chapter on the slide and just let it stay there as a way to sort of think big picture about what the chapter uh, involves. And then uh, we'll read these verses. I will offer some uh, analysis verse by verse. I will uh, try to highlight how different English translations uh, try to handle the language of these verses. And then we will give considerable time to important questions. Uh, for example, in chapter 2, you can split the chapter into two, two sections. The outline of chapter 2 is the easiest outline of 1 Timothy and the shortest. And you can basically take the first eight verses, which are clearly talking about prayer, especially in the context of the assembly, and then in the second half of the chapter, there's a lot being said here about uh, women in the assembly and their uh, contribution to the work of the local church. So we're going to let that outline stand. And so in chapter 2, we'll talk about the first eight verses, 
uh, in the first 25 minutes or so we have, and then we'll talk about the second half of the chapter. And uh, as we said last night, your comments and questions and observations last night were excellent, and I know they will be tonight. And I'm trying to cover a lot of material, but I never want you to feel like rushing through the material is more important than hearing from you. So please feel welcome to uh, jump in there if there's something you'd like to add to this. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and let's read verses 1 through 8. And I'm reading from the New American Standard uh, translation. I'm not <coughs> insisting that that's necessarily the best, but I do think it's an accurate translation. But I also like to read comparatively so that I can see what I'm missing. Uh, usually I'll read five translations after looking at the Greek text in the sermon prep. I'll look at the uh, New American Standard, the ESV, the New King James. Uh, I'll usually look at the NIV because it's the most popular translation since 1970. And maybe another one like the New Living Translation. And just compare those. Uh, I preach from the New American Standard, and the reason why is because I preached in Baton Rouge for six years, and that's what was in the pew. Uh, and I liked being able, when people were in the assembly, we have a lot of visitors in Baton Rouge who knew nothing about the Bible, to be able to say, uh, if you're visiting with us today, take one of those Bibles out the pew in front of you and turn with me to page 174. I found that that was a really great way for visitors to stay with me in the text and not spend the whole time looking for Nehemiah. And so that's just a personal thing, but please don't think I'm attacking your favorite translation. I'm of the opinion that the best Bible is a red Bible, not R-E-D, R-E-A-D. And if you read that and compare that, uh, I believe that that word is inspired and profitable, just like Paul says in 2 Timothy 3. So let's read the first eight verses, and then we'll discuss this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, uh, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Verse 8, Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Okay? Um, obviously, we're going to have to... Uh, move through these verses quickly, I, I just was sort of uh, laughing at the fact that recently I preached a sermon on verses 1 and 2, I preached a sermon on verse 4, I preached a different sermon on verse 5. We could literally take the whole three hours tonight to look at the first eight verses of this chapter, so I don't want to rush through this and, and not do justice to the perfect text we have in front of us, but uh, let's start with this verb in verse 1. Uh, maybe your translation may say, therefore, I urge, I beseech, I implore, I entreat. Uh, the verb here, parakaleo, uh, is a passionate word that Paul uses frequently as a way of saying, I really want you to know this is what God wants you to do. And uh, the verb there is very powerful. Notice in verse 1 that Paul uses four different words for prayer. Uh, now, translations are all over the place on this, and the reason is, it's sort of like psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in uh, Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19. Those words are not mutually exclusive. They overlap some. And so, uh, let me give you an example of this. The first word, the eises in Greek, is translated entreaties in the New American Standard, supplications in the ASV, ESV, King James, and RSV, requests in the NAP Bible, and petitions in the NIV. So how can English translations translate that first word, entreaties, supplications, requests, and petitions? Well, because it's a word for prayer. And in English, we might describe prayer in all four of those ways. But irregardless of your translation, you should have four words there 
that refer to prayer. In the New American Standard, it's a treatise, uh, prayers, which, by the way, every translation I consulted has prayers second, including the NIV, ESV, New American Standard. Then you have requests or petitions in most translations third, and then thanksgivings. Now, if yours isn't exactly like that, my point is, these are synonymous expressions. And I think the fact that it doesn't just, this verse doesn't just mention prayers, it uses the word all, which is another categorical way of saying um, everything, I'm urging you that every time you approach the throne of God, um, you pray for everyone, uh, all people. Now, your translation there may say, like the New American Standard at the end of verse 1, all men. That's not a bad translation. But be aware that there are two words for man in Greek. Aner, which could be translated male, man, or husband in some contexts. Gunai is the noun for woman, wife, or uh, lady. It's interesting how some translations say lady. Uh, but there's another word, anthropos, that could refer to a human being. And so um, this is where the gender-inclusive language of Bible translation can be controversial. But just know that at the end of verse 1, uh, that includes men and women, all people. I would actually prefer to translate it all people. I don't have a problem with translating it men as long as everybody understands that what's being said here is I want to be prayerful with regard to everyone, but especially verse 2, those who are in positions of authority. We know God instituted the government, Deuteronomy 17, Romans 13, 1 through 7, 1 Peter uh, 3, this is some, 1 Peter 2. This is something we see repeated quite frequently. And so he says in verse 2, uh, pray for not just everyone, but all kings and ones in authority. In order that, here's the purpose, you might lead a quiet life in godliness and, and this last word is where you'll see a lot of variation in translations. Uh, the New American Standard and New Living Bible says dignity. The King James says honesty. The ASV says gravity. The NIV says holiness. You could also translate this sincerity. The idea is that our prayers for other people. I mean, here's the principle, right? Galatians 6.10, what does Paul say? Do good to all people everywhere, but especially those of a household of faith. And I think what Paul's saying here to Timothy, and we would assume also to the Christians Timothy would be serving, uh, this is what 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is all about. Pray without ceasing doesn't mean, uh, you know, that, by the way, that verse is in a sandwich. The verse right before it uh, and right after it are also impossible commands. In that, uh, in everything, give thanks. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Those are, those are platitudes, but they describe an attitude, right? A an attitude of gratitude and a platitude. Okay, I've got to stop. But, <laughs> you know, the point is, uh, be prayerful for everyone. Uh, and the benefit will be, not necessarily that you're sheltered, but uh, the idea of quietness here is that, uh, it would be ideal for you to be able to focus on kingdom work and be free from turmoil. Now, we're going to be persecuted. Jesus in the Beatitudes says, blessed are the persecuted, right? Uh, but as prayerful people, one of the things we desire is to live a quiet and tranquil life. And, and I think you see this wrapped up in verses 3 and 4, and I would recommend this is all tied in together that by leading a quiet and tranquil life, we can be more focused on evangelism. What does God desire? And verse 3 says this is good and acceptable uh, in the sight of our, our Savior, God our Savior. Uh, who desires all people or men? It's the same word we had back in verse 1. It includes everyone. To come to the knowledge of truth. In my opinion, verse 4 and 5 are two of the most powerful verses in the whole letter. Because we learn something about God's intent, and we learn something about God's work. Have you ever taken a teacher and you thought they wanted you to fail a class? <laughs> I took a CPR class in college, and 
the lady, I think, wanted me not only to not be able to save lives, I think she wanted to take my life. I mean, she, she didn't like me very much. And I think it's because she had 31 students and I was the only male, which I kind of liked at that point in my life. Um, but she, I, it was obvious she did not want me to be successful. I really struggled in that class because I didn't feel like she wanted me to do well in the class. Isn't it wonderful to know what God desires? And to know how this is supported by a verse like Romans 2.10, God is not a respecter of persons, or what God through Peter says uh, in the Cornelius context of Acts 10.34, God does not show partiality. Uh, God doesn't give me an advantage over you with regard to desiring that I be in heaven. And furthermore, look at the work of Jesus in verse 5. That word mediator, there's one God and. It's interesting that uh, here you have Jesus called both a God and uh, a man. And I think that highlights who our Lord is. Uh, for God is one, and there's one mediator between God and man, the man, or a man, Jesus Christ. Uh, the, verb, uh, the, the noun there, mesetes in Greek, uh, to be a mediator, and i got to be careful because I could preach on this for an hour and a half. This is such a rich word. But the word mediator means he has access to power, but he has a connection to the people who need help. And I think an illustration of a mediator would be Moses, who had access to God's power at Sinai, but he was also the leader of the children of Israel. He was the mediator. Or Esther. Um, Esther had access to the king, and she had a connection to the Jewish people, and was willing to die for her nation. Mordecai says, maybe you've been given this power for such a time as this. But the difference between Esther as mediator and Jesus as mediator is Jesus was not only willing to die for his people, like Esther, he did die. And I think that speaks to the desire and the heart and the goal of God. So if God wants, I'd throw out one more verse. Remember what Jesus says in the Zacchaeus account. We think about Zacchaeus as the wee little man, uh, but in Luke 19, verse 10, it's in the midst of the Zacchaeus story that Jesus tells us why he came. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So God had one son and he was a missionary. And the greatest example of missional activity that the world has ever seen is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And even Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations, according to Isaiah 40 to 42. So be prayerful. I urge you, be prayerful for all people, especially for kings and those in positions of authority. Now, when's Paul writing this? Right before he dies. Or Who's uh, Caesar? Nero. Nero. I thought I was supposed to only like the government when I liked the president and the congress and the governor and the mayor and my taxes were good and my finances were good and my services were good and I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to support government as long as it works in my favor. If you look at the three passages in the New Testament that say the most about government, Romans 13, Nero's in charge. Probably his first five years, but 1 Peter 3, Nero's in charge. Uh, here in 1 Timothy 2, Nero's in charge. And uh, I'd add one more. Revelation 13, when John's talking about this, I would date Revelation to the early 90s. Domitian, 81 to 96, is Caesar. And both of those men, Nero and Domitian, were known as Christian killers. And so the idea that I'm going to pray for, for presidents I like, and if I don't like them, I'm going to pray an imprecatory prayer. You know, I hope they die. No. Uh, the message is, submit... Be known for your citizenship. And there are occasions, the Hebrew midwives, Shua and Hua, and uh, Peter in Acts uh, 4, and uh, Daniel would be a great place to go to see civil disobedience. But um, I've participated in the political process, but I need to be known for something greater than politics. I need to be known for my higher citizenship and living a life that is honorable in the sight of God. And Paul says, be prayerful and remember what matters most. And what matters most? <coughs> the will of God.
So Jesus is the mediator, and look what he does in verse 6. He gave himself a ransom, a substitute, an exchange. Uh, the challenge with the word there is this is, uh, this is called, you might see this word, so I'm going to write this down. Uh, this is called Hapax Legomenon. What? L-E-G-O-M-E-N-O-N. A Hapax, that's an X. Legomenon. It's a word that only occurs once in the Greek New Testament. You know, uh, the word Theopneustos in 2 Timothy 3.16 that Jeremy wrote his thesis on is a Hapax Legomenon. It only used, it's only used once in the New Testament. So what does ransom mean? Uh, we know what ransom means, but we don't get any help from other places in the New Testament in terms of this one word. Antelutron is the word, and uh, most English translations translate this, ransom, substitute, exchange. The idea is that he did this for everyone. Now, uh, I hate to rush through this, but, but I've got to get to verses 9 through 15. But... Uh, Look at the prepositional phrase after the word ransom. Who did he give himself as a ransom for? Oh. Anybody ever heard of the false idea of limited atonement? The system of Calvinism likes the flower, the tulip, and it presupposes that people are unable to do anything to help themselves, total hereditary depravity, that, uh, and a number of other things, that God handpicks who he wants to save, unconditional election, and that it's only the saved that uh, Jesus really died for. But what I see in verse 6 is not only uh, in verse 4, God wants everybody to be saved. Verse 5, there's one mediator for all. Verse 6, he's a ransom for all. And if you look even at verse 7, Paul's ministry was directed primarily to Gentiles who, according to Ephesians 2, before... Christ were a long way from Christ, but the wall of division or partition was torn down, and now, uh, I think that's temple imagery, they have access to God. And Paul's whole ministry has been about proclaiming that good news. And so you even see it in verse 8. Who is to pray lifting up holy hands without wrath? Men everywhere. Not just Jews, not just Gentiles. And I would just make note of the fact that the word there in verse 8 is men, Andros. The name Andre, uh, my favorite baseball player of all time, Andre Dawson, right? Filled for the Chicago Cubs, so put in the Hall of Fame for you. His name means man, Andre, Andres. So it's interesting that when the shift occurs to worship in particular, we move from anthropos, which is a gender inclusive noun for people, to Andros in verse 8. So you might just make a note. I want the men, verse 8. That's, that's gender specific. All the other references thus far could be translated people. But in verse 8, I want the men to pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without uh, division. Now, let me say one thing, and I'll hush, and we'll talk about this. Uh, Paul makes reference to his own ministry, which we've seen before already in chapter 1 and verse 7. But in verse 8, we sometimes get focused on the posture of prayer, right? Lifting up. We look at the lifting up. Uh, and we do know that you have uh, Jesus in the garden praying, face down, lying prostrate in the garden, we sometimes sing. There are other occasions where people lower their eyes, lift up their eyes, lift their hands. Uh, but I think if we focus only on the lifting up and we miss the holy, the adjective, holy hands, and we miss the uh, last phrase in verse 8, and this is where English translations just go crazy. Literally, without wrath and questioning. Now, ASV disputed, ESV quarreling, King James doubted, New American Standard dissension. That Bible dispute, the Christian Standard Bible arguments, but every one of those comes back to the reality that um, if I have sin in my life or 
if I have not been reconciled with my brother, then prayer is hindered. Remember 1 Peter 3, 7? That warning that husbands' prayers will be hindered by the way they treat their wives. After six verses of Peter talking to the women, he really lowers the boom on the man in verse 7, you know, in 1 Peter 3. And so, what does Paul desire? I wish, bulamai, I literally, I wish for men, andros, to pray everywhere or in every place, lifting up holy hands without wrath uh, or questioning. And I think the reason he says this here is because those uh, obstacles are barriers to prayer being effective. Um, if my hands are dirty with sin, if my attitude towards you is sinful, then how effective will my prayer be? How can I live at peace with all people in a quiet, tranquil life? You know, I'm praying for you. Well, you know what I'm praying? That you suffer. Well, that's not what he's saying. It's not. He's saying... A genuine love for other people means we pray for them and we strive to share with them what the heart of this section of 1 Timothy 2 is all about. What does God desire? All people be saved. How does he prove that? There's one mediator who gave himself as a ransom for all. What's the implication of that? Uh, that we be known for our prayers. That we be known for our holiness. Including people that make life hard on us. And I think in this context, that would be Nero. Uh, I'm going to even pray for my enemies. And that doesn't just include the neighbor who keeps blowing leaves in my yard. Uh, that includes people who might come in and, you know, the reason Hebrews 11 is so powerful is because of Hebrews 10, where we read that these Christians uh, had had, some of them had had their property seized, some of them had been imprisoned. Some of them were going to endure a fiery trial. So why is he giving all these examples by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith? Because their faith's being tested. Uh, I really think the world isn't surprised when we're praising the Lord when uh, we're wealthy and healthy and there's blue skies and rainbows. I think uh, here are some Christians, including Timothy, who aren't experiencing those pleasant days. And that's when the world really sees faithfulness, right? They need to see it every day. But when we're being persecuted and opposed and hated and uh, treated with contempt, how do we respond? What do you think about the first eight verses? I'm sorry to kind of run roughshod over that, but uh, I do feel the clock a little bit. I'm not sure what lifted up full of hands means. I don't think we practice that. <clears throat> Well, I hope we do, because I think the emphasis is on nowhere in Scripture are we told, here's the posture you have to have when you pray. As a matter of fact, in this verse, uh, lifting up is a participle that's tied to the verb to pray. While you're praying, here is the manner in which that prayer is being made evident. And uh, if we were to say that you've got to have hands raised in order for your prayer to be effective, well then Jesus really missed out on that in the garden. I think what is being said is your disposition towards other people and your standing with the Lord. How about lifestyle? If that's not a part of disposition and standing, I don't know what <laughs> is, right? But absolutely. What's being said is uh, let's see your hands. Are they holy? What's that mean? How have you treated your neighbor? How have you treated your enemy? How have you treated your brother? How have you, how have you responded to the Lord? And uh, that's why in the Old Testament, the prophets continually warn about, uh, I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. It's not that God's throwing out the sacrificial system. It's that people were doing that in a ritualistic fashion, and their hearts were a long way from God. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, but if it was talking about eight fingers and two thumbs and two palms, then the women couldn't pray like that because it was talking about males in this verse. And it could, no, I, it could be talking about as they lead in the assembly based on what's coming, but this would exclude women. And I think, I would, I would, if somebody were to use this verse to say, well, the only way you can pray is if you're raising hands. 
that Jesus missed out on his death. Well, I, and I'm not saying he did, but I, I think if you choose to raise your hands while you pray, I'm not going to stand in judgment of that. Uh, as long as you're not doing that for show or to be a distraction or whatever. But it's really not about posture. It's about a disposition towards the Lord and towards other people. Would you say that was an ancient prayer posture? Yeah, just it's like kneeling. Yeah, just not part of our culture today. Not necessarily. Instead. There might be someone who, but I, you know, I know people who, I knew a great gospel preacher, and uh, he didn't do this as a show. As a matter of fact, if you didn't know to look for it, you wouldn't see it. But every time there was a prayer before the sermon, he was kneeling. Probably in the back, maybe in the pew. Uh, and it wasn't that he was doing that to be seen of men. It was just a way for him privately, without, again, being a distraction to others, to, I think, communicate what was in his heart. I, I am unworthy to stand in the presence of God. So uh, I pray lying down with my wife at night before bed. I pray sitting at the table with my kids. Sometimes I pray driving especially on I-75. Sometimes I pray uh, in the shower. Sometimes I pray sitting at my desk. Um, but am I praying with holy hands? Yes, sir. I've uh, visited uh, congregations, uh, even different denominations, where they would stand up and they would hold their hands up. Is that that's not what they're talking about necessarily? Again, I, I don't think posture is the primary point of emphasis. I think it's about holiness. What... The adjective here, holy hands, especially given the way that this prepositional phrase at the end of verse 8, without wrath and disputes. Um, that's what holiness means. It's, uh, hey, if you've got irreconciled problems with your brother, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go make peace. Because those problems don't have nothing to do with your eight fingers, two thumbs, and two palms. <laughs> it's got to do with what you treated or not treated somebody. Yeah, and so whether you're lifting hands or lying down or folded hands or it's where are you with regard to your relationship with God and how are you treating other people? In my Bible references uh, Psalms 132. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, it's a great passage. And it says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. And again, You're literally saying, and if you if you choose to pray that way, I don't think there's anything at all problematic with that. I would just say, are they holding? Whether they're folded, whether they're at your sides, whether you have hands or not. I, I mean, know a guy that don't have arms. I was I was just about to say, uh, I think we would need to be careful here about being literal with this. It's sort of like. Um, you know, in 1 Corinthians 11, I think the reason we know we're talking about wives of the prophets is because when Paul says, ask your husbands at home, not everybody has a husband. Are we excluding single ladies? Are we excluding widows? I mean, that's situational to a specific group of women who have prophetic husbands. Um, if you don't have a husband, you can't follow that command. It's kind of like, you know, if your ox falls in a ditch, the uh, casuistic law of the Old Testament. Well, if I don't have an ox, that, that law really doesn't apply to me. Uh, one of my favorite laws, and I'll get back to the text. We're just going to, we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Uh, but one of my favorite laws in ancient Israel involved parapets. I had a student one time that thought I said parrots. And really, it's <laughs> error. But anybody know what a parapet is? It's a half wall. And the law of Israel said, and I'll give you the reference when we come back, because I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. But the law of Israel says, if you're building a new house, build a half wall around your roof. Now, if I'm not building a new house, that law doesn't apply to me. So there are some laws that apply universally. There are some laws that apply only in certain situations. But you know why in Israel they were commanded to build a half wall around the roof? Do people ever go on their roofs? And do you want your neighbor to fall off your roof? There was a way to protect yourself and your neighbor built into the law. That's why in Deuteronomy, Moses says, when we get into the land of Canaan, if you build a house and bulls start growing on the wall, tear it down. If it's black mold. If it's green mold, let it go. And uh, I don't know about that. I don't know if I want green or black. I might just tear it down anyway. But the point is, 
Um, there are some laws that might apply to certain individuals. And although men are mentioned here in verse 8, everything before verse 8, verses 1 through 7, that speaks about being prayerful regarding all people, especially those in positions of authority, remember what God wants, remember what Jesus accomplished, remember what Paul's ministry is about. And then verse 8 we get, but I want all men, while you're praying, to make sure that you're lifting holy hands without wrath and without disputes. Uh, and it's hypocritical for me to hate my brother and get up before the congregation and act like I don't, I don't do that. Uh, I'm not interested in playing church. Like it makes to this really be sincere with the God. You know, even yeah, be holy. That's it. Be no holy. Shit. How about I'm like you, just whenever I... I might be driving down the road with uh, whatever. Some pops I need to talk to. Well, and driving's a great time. Unless I've got my four kids in the car, oh, then I'm yes. yelling at children. Good luck. Why are you not driving? Just a full drive. I got a, a quick question about anthropos. Would you say a, would it, uh, a good translation be mankind? Or humankind. Human. In the, in the plural. Um, mm -hmm. There are occasions where it refers to a specific man. We actually have an occasion in this text. Uh, let's see, back up in verse uh, 5. This at the end of verse 5 when it says, One man, Jesus Christ, anthropos Christos Jesus. So sometimes anthropos clearly refers to a man. And I know this is getting into the second half of the chapter, but I think the maleness of Christ was intentional. Now don't get me wrong. Uh, Galatians 3, 28 and other passages that talk about Jesus being the Savior of men and women are legitimate and should be read. But Jesus was a leader. He's leading worship uh, as he reached from Isaiah and Luke 4 in the synagogue. He chooses 12 male apostles. Uh, there is the principle of headship is evident even in the ministry of Jesus. And so... Uh, I've chased a rabbit. I'm sorry. But with regard to your question, this is why we can't assume that a Greek or Hebrew word always should be translated the same way. Um, the, the word panuma in Greek or uh, ruach in Hebrew means wind or breath. And it gets really tricky in John 3 when uh, Jesus and Nicodemus are having this conversation about the wind blows where it wishes and the spirit up. Oh, how do I know which? Well, it's completely based on the context. But I would just say that in verse 5, anthropos is clearly man. Uh, and so I don't have a problem with men or mankind. But I also don't have a problem with translations that would say people or humankind. Because we know contextually that we're including, uh, that we're including everybody. You know, sometimes we know just enough Greek to be dangerous. And I tell students... You've learned the alphabet, and we translated 1 John, but that doesn't make us infallible. We need to, we need to be humble in our, uh, in our study of this, and, and uh, I must say that uh, it can be challenging to sort of work through all of this. Yes, sir? I got, I got two questions. The um, okay. first one I exhort, this is my translation. Piratalo. Yes. Is, is that, would you say that's a command? Yes. It's not in the imperative mood, um, but I'll just, I'll just highlight this. That verb is used five times in Romans, twice in 1 Corinthians, four times in 2 Corinthians, once in Ephesians. Uh, we've got it at least two more times in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.1 and 1 Timothy 6.2, twice in Titus. This is one of Paul's favorite words to say, I'm telling you to do this. Give me your attention. Thank you. Like 1 Corinthians 1.10. Uh, twice in 1 Corinthians, including that reference. Uh, okay, so the next question is verse 8, Bulamai. What do you think? Is that a command? Um, it's middle passive, meaning uh, because it's a deponent verb, uh, without going into. Is that the ice cream truck? Yep. <laughs> hey, great <break> time. <laughs> Uh, no, I think uh, what's being communicated there is uh, in a very similar way to Paracolo in verse 1. 
this is what I desire. And I don't think Paul is saying, I really want you to do this. Uh, as an apostle, remember the greeting in verse 1 of chapter 1. This is God's will. And uh, this is what Christians ought to be known for. Uh, <clears throat> let's take just a moment to read verses 9 through 15. And I want to say a couple of things, and then we'll break and come back and chew on that some more, because I cannot only take a couple of minutes on chapter on this section and feel good about life. Okay, so uh, let's read together 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 through 15, and I promise we'll take a break soon, before maybe even before the ice cream truck leaves. Uh, verse 9 of 1 Timothy 2. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, Modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression but women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Okay, so this passage raises at least three big questions. First, what about this dress? Does this mean it's wrong to wear jewelry or nice clothing? Some religious groups have taken it to mean that. I don't think that's the primary point. We're going to talk about what modesty meant then and what it should still mean now. Um, it's a good thing to wear clothing and to be covered, but a lot of the problems with modesty in the first century church were ostentatious dress. People coming to the assembly to be seen because I've got this nice bag and nice dress and look at me and making a show. The second question, obviously, is the big one. Uh, what does it mean for a woman to be silent uh, or to learn uh, in quietness, a word we've already seen in this chapter? And why does Paul appeal to creation there, the order of creation? We highlighted that a bit last night. And then the third question that I think is the hardest is verse 15. What does it mean when Paul says they will be preserved to the bearing of children if they continue in love, sanctity, and self-restraint? Uh, what about women that aren't married? What about women that don't have children? Uh, I want to I talk about that. So... Uh, let's take a break, and we'll come back, and we'll do that, and then we'll get into the qualification of elders. Before we take another break, then we'll do deacons, and we'll do chapter 4, and we'll all get some oxygen at about 9 o'clock uh, after running through these three great chapters, okay? So let's take a break. I think there's some good snacks in there. We'll see what Jeremy brought in. I'm excited.